One of the things we're going to talk about this morning is where we've been the last few weeks. Anybody know what the name of the series that we're doing is called? Okay, it's just a phase, so ignore it. Don't miss it. She works here. She works here. Hey, if you're with us online, thanks for joining us. Uh, just in case maybe it's your first time online or maybe it's your first time in the room and you have no idea what we've talked about for the last few weeks, uh, I think it's important that we always recap where we've been for those people to, to fill apart and, and know where we're going. And I think it helps us live out Romans 12, 2, where it says to have your minds renewed and transform your thoughts and test them against the will of God. And so let's just recap where we've been so we can get our thoughts going, our minds going. In week one, I got the honor uh, of introducing uh, the It's Just the Phase series uh, that we've been teaching, uh, and don't miss it. And one of the things we did is we established what we mean by phase, right? A phase is a distinct time frame in a person's life that has unique challenges and unique opportunities. This helps us clarify that it's not a season, because seasons repeat. I would say they're predictable, but it just snowed. So phases probably don't repeat, uh, and it's probably not as easy to predict like seasons are. So we don't call them seasons when we think of this, right? And the first week, the big idea was a fool says, it's just a phase, I can ignore it, it will pass. But the wise says, there's an opportunity here, and I'm not going to miss it. And so that's what we want to do. That's just paraphrasing scripture when it says, live as wise, not as unwise, making the most of every opportunity for the days are evil. And then in week two, part two, Pastor Randy came and talked to us, uh, continuing the series. And he talked about something that I think the enemy will often use to remove you or derail or throw your current phase off tracks. And that's discouragement. And how we'll face those times when discouragement is creeping in. But he gave us a solution to beat discouragement. And it was that Jesus is still good. And that's the big idea from week two is Jesus is still good. And if you can remember that and you can know that, Every opportunity and every challenge from those phases can really glorify God and make him known to people. But you got to remember, Jesus is good. And speaking of having to remember, last week, student pastor Justin had a really easy way to, it's just a phase, so don't miss it. Well, you know how you don't miss it? Make sure to remember it is what he told us last week. Real easy, real easy to really know where he was going. And he said, because remembering where you have been will help you remember how God, our Lord, has brought us through. And that's huge. I think a lot of times people said, oh, just in the past, leave it. Well, that's not what Rafiki said. Rafiki said, it's in the past. You can run from it or you can learn from it. And so we want to be able to remember so we can learn from it. And so if we can remember how the Lord has brought us through, it will help us show and tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's where Justin talked about the woman at the well and how Jesus didn't remind her of her past so that she would be condemned. He reminded her of her past so she would get up and go tell the entire town that knew everything about her that a man just told her everything that could save her. Whew. That's why you remember, man, because other people need to know. And so he said something that I think is very critical for fighting the discouragement or fighting things that would take you off the track in your face. He said, Jesus doesn't remind you of your past to keep you there. He reminds you of your past so he can move you forward. And I remember hearing that last weekend when I was playing army and doing my, uh, my monthly drills that I have to do. And there were a lot of people around uh, listening to who don't, probably don't really know God. Uh, and, and I said, hey, I want to share my own thing. Because they know me. They didn't know Justin, so I needed to make it personal. And I shared with, you know what that means to me is I remember a few years ago when I kind of like got called out for doing some really stupid things. I had a group of people who loved me and said, hey, you say you love Jesus. We're going to make sure you live like you love Jesus so he can change you. And I, uh, I was walking past Chris, Carlo, and Luther. They were in Chris's office. And I was eavesdropping, which, by the way, this is free. The tithes have already passed around. It's eaves. It's not ease for any of you today who are still stuck and Jesus hasn't changed you. I said eavesdropping for most of my life. It's eaves with a V. Anyways, that was free. Back to the eavesdropping, all right? I'm in the hallway and I hear them say my name. So I'm like, oh, what's this? Because I was still terrified they were going to fire me. Because when people find out the worst of you, my history is when Christians find out the worst of you, they get rid of you. And so I was still under the impression, nah, this ain't real Jesus love. They're, they're just waiting for me to slip up again to, to get rid of me. And Carlos said, so where do we think Seth is at? How do we think he's doing? And Pastor Chris, rightfully and understandfully so, said, well, understandably, I won't say right, rightfully, but understandably, he says, I don't know. I just feel like Seth has still got a long way to go before he's teaching again. And Luther, uh, Pastor Luther, Executive Pastor Luther, my friend, my small group leader, um, 
He said, are you kidding me? Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus doesn't say, look at how far you have to go. Jesus says, look at how far I've brought you. Look what I've already done through you. And so for the rest of your life, I want you to be able to Romans 12, 2 thoughts and say, okay, is that from heaven or is that from hell? If it's trying to remind you of how far you have to go because of what you've done, it's not from heaven. If it says, look how far I've already brought you, and it reminds you of everything he's brought you through, that's from heaven. Okay? And that's a great way to remember. And I could talk about Justin's message forever because I was listening to where I could communicate to others. Here's a free point too. Listen on Sundays so that you can communicate to others. Okay? But we got to move on to the next part. I get you got to hear me talk. So we'll just recap part three real quick. And the, and the big idea was this. Uh, wait, where'd it go? I lost it. Dang. I was eavesdropping still in my brain. He said to make sure to remember in the phases so that you can share the gospel with others. And so I hope that as we do that, we'll remember um, what Jesus can do. Remembering the phases helps you remember what Jesus can do and what he has brought you through. And today on part four... Uh, we're going to talk about some similar things. We haven't really been talking about specific phases, as in like you're in this phase or this phase. Uh, but by the way, we're going to be having a, a short-term six-week life group in a few weeks, probably closer to middle of May, uh, on parenting. And where there are specific phases that you can help uh, your children develop and understand who they are so you can know like, hey, your kid doesn't need to know the exact understanding of the Holy Trinity at seven years old. We can help you have very biblical, easy application for your kids to know God's love and glorify him. And, and we want to do that with you. If you're, if you're interested in doing this uh, short-term six-week life group, that would happen on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Uh, see myself or a staff member get signed up. And I would sign up quickly. There are a few families who don't even come to our church that are interested in, in becoming parents who could better uh, glorify God. So we want that. And that will have specific phases. But we're talking about, or we have talked about, a couple of things that could throw your phase off the tracks. But because God is good, we've also pointed to the things that could keep your phase on the tracks. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, a few similar things. But before we talk about those things, don't laugh, but watch this video. That was me at 27 and a half attempting to do a backflip. As uh, Woody would say, that's falling with style, Buzz. I didn't really get it. When I was uh, 27 and a half, we had um, some foster kiddos living with us. One of them had lived um, with us for six months, Landon and Anthony. You guys have met them. But they've been here quite a few times. God is still good. Uh, and thankfully, he allows them to come visit us. Every time they get a break, they still want to come hang out with us. Well, he'd been with us for six months. He got to come home for a couple months, and then it was his birthday. And I think it's because he knows I like to party. He's like, hey, why don't you guys do my birthday? I'm like, duh. I think he just knew we would go to the trampoline park. He's smart like that. And so I said, okay, man, what do you want for your birthday? And when you ask a 10-year-old what they want for their birthday, you probably get like an Xbox, maybe some new cleats because they're playing football, maybe, I don't know, some curries, something. But what I got when I said, what do you want for your birthday? He said, I want to teach you how to do a backflip. Listen, my whole childhood, I avoided backflips, okay? My, when I lived over on Head Drive back in ninth grade, I used to go across the, a couple yards to my friend Jeremy's house. I could jump off of his roof onto the trampoline and do a double front flip, but I would not do a backflip because that one time I landed on my neck and died. Or at least it felt like I died, and I was worried I would die. So I avoided backflips, right? My child is like, no, nah, Seth, that's dumb. Well, my childhood also made me want to be a good dad. And so when he said, I want to teach you how to do a backflip, I just did. I said, bet. Which if you don't know what bet means, it means okay or all right. But it makes you sound tough and confident about what you're about to do. So I said, bet. Help me, Jesus. You know, I was really worried because I know how it had gone before. Uh, but we, we would practice. We'd go to the foam pit, and he would just tell me, it's easy. It's easy. No. You ever, tell, you ever have someone tell you, oh, it's easy, it's fine, it's easy. That's like telling someone who has a legitimate struggle with anxiety, just calm down. What? Relax. Husbands, you ever tell your wife that? Yeah, hey, don't even, yeah. That was real quiet, no. Anyways, he's saying, it's easy. You just throw your hand, jump, throw your hands up, and then tuck your knees, and it does everything. 
I do it in the foam pit a couple times. Well, needless to say, I'm able to do a backflip today. Uh, way better than that. That was a, uh, I'd blame the jump socks for slipping. That wasn't my fault. No, that was, that's what happens when you just are first getting it. But uh, I want to talk about if anybody else has a story like that. I don't mean a backflip story. Okay. I mean, like, well, wait a second. How many of you guys are 25 years and older and can do a backflip today? One, two, a one, two. Dude, if you've been in the military and you can't do a backflip, you weren't in the military. I'm just kidding. Hey, listen. I'm not talking about a backflip story. I'm talking about a story of failure and disappointment that caused you to avoid something for like 13 and a half years or never even try something for the first time. You got one of those stories? That's what we're going to talk about today, failure and disappointment. And really, they go hand in hand. Matter of fact, last uh, two weeks ago, Pastor Randy talked about discouragement. I believe discouragement is often a byproduct of a failure from us or from someone else. And someone being disappointed in us. I think discouragement is one of those things that raises up from that. And so I don't know what you failed or what caused disappointment, a job, a relationship, a hobby that you just, you thought you were going to be good at, but you were terrible at. I I don't know. But I know that I failed a lot of things in my life. I know there have been times when people needed me, but I had my own stuff going on and couldn't show up for family, friends, or, or people when they needed me to come through. Maybe you're in the room and you think, you know, parenting failures, right? Maybe you had stuff going on at work and you brought it at home and now it's a thing that's going on at home when it had no business being a thing that was going on at home. Maybe you've got a story like that. Just some failures in your everyday life. Anybody, anybody have stories like that? If we're honest, everybody would say yes because we all have stories like that. It's just whether or not we're to a point where God has given us the confidence uh, to share those. But we all have stories like that. I'm not here to tell everybody, all right, just come on down. We're going to go one by one. What's your failure? Go. We don't do that. Uh, We hope that you do that. That's the purpose of life groups and us raising those up and trying to get more of them is so that we can share those things together. But the question today is how do you respond when you fail? What do you do? Do you wait 13 and a half years before you try again? No, a backflip's nothing cool, but I wish I would not have wasted my life. It is way more fun to do a backflip than a front flip, and it's way easier. But how do you respond when you fail? Do you deny it? Do you ignore it? Do you say, no, nah, that wasn't me? It wasn't that bad. Do you pretend that it just didn't happen? Do you just lie about it? Or do you do, you do the other and you say, you know, I, I knew things were going to fail. I actually was hoping that things would fall to pieces. Nobody does that. I use facetiousness a lot to show you that you know that's not who you are. So we don't do that, but how do we respond? What do you do when you're in the middle of a phase and disappointment or failures start to creep up in that phase? Well, the good news is you don't have to miss it because God is with you and he is present in those failures and those disappointments. So today, we're going to face our failure. Anybody come to service this morning thinking, man, I'm just going to face my failures? You all did? Okay, well, hey, listen, close your eyes. You don't have to face your failures this morning, all right? Listen, if anybody can help you know that it's okay to be a failure, I mean, I'm living proof, as Austin French, as Austin French would say. I'm living proof. But we're going to have a lot of scripture. So I need you to buckle up and get ready to go through this, okay? We're going to be in Romans 7. And if you don't have a copy of God's Word, word with you this morning, uh, if you'd like a copy of God's Word and you don't have means to one, we can make sure you don't leave this building today without one. Uh, I can also show you how to just get a copy of God's Word on your phone so you can have it even in McDonald's uh, because those people need to eat fresh. Oh, that's Subway. Uh, right? We're going to be in Romans 7 and we're going to be 8, so you don't got to go back and forth. Okay, just Romans 7, Romans 8, and we're going to dive right into it because we got a lot of goodness of God to unpack today. In Romans 7... Verse 14, here's what Paul starts to say. We know, remember Romans 7, verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, okay? So the law is just shorthand uh, for God's will, all right, for your life. God's will for your life, it's just shorthand. It's, spiritual means it's, it's of God's will, which means it's for God, from God, and it is for good, right? So it's what God calls you to, what he commands you to, it's from him, and it's for good. So that's, that's really what he's saying here when he talks about, for we know that the law is spiritual. God's will is spiritual, it's good for you, it's from God. And then he continues on, but I, we, are unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin, for I do not understand my own actions. I know many of us in this room, I know all of us, but I'll give you space to allow Jesus to do it. 
at some point we have said, I have no idea why I do what I do. I have no idea what I'm even doing. And if you, that's not true, then during the pandemic, when it first set in and all these things happened, there wasn't a pastor in the world who knew what he was doing. There wasn't a boss in the world who knew what they were doing. As parents, many of you had no idea what you're doing when they said, you're going to be virtual schooling. What is that? Right? We had no idea what we were doing. So we've all been there. We've all been there. Paul goes on, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Well, in case you're curious, that's the official motto of failure. That's what failure looks like, right? What I want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, I do. Paul goes on. Hey, it's just a face, so don't miss it. Right? We want somebody to grow up and know that they are welcome in the house of God, and it wasn't this super religious structured thing where they couldn't be free in who they are, right? So what an easy opportunity to exercise not missing it, okay? Paul goes on, and he says right here in verse 16, Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law. That is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. I'm going to read that one more time for you. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Many of you all don't know that. Most Christians in the United States of America do not understand what that means because of what you call yourself, and we're going to get back to it. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. But to hear Paul, like repeating himself over and over and just confused and like, why? And, and I think he's just really trying to be passionate about what all of us have known at some point. Like this is, man, why do I keep doing what I don't want to do? But I mean, ain't that the truth though? Like I got plenty of time. I got plenty of capacity to do the evil stuff. But that good stuff, you know, I was gonna, I was gonna call someone I was, gonna, I was gonna do the good I wanted to. I was gonna write them a letter. I was gonna make them a casserole. I was gonna call someone and tell them I love them. I was gonna spend time with my kids. I was going to do a little more work. I was going to get an A on that test. I don't do the good that I wanna do, but I'm consistent at finding time to do the evil. And listen, if you've ever felt that, there's hope. Matter of fact, if you think that you've never felt that, we should talk. Because this is, when you encounter Jesus the way Paul did, you should go through this. Because here's the good news. The closer you get to God, the more you realize that you don't do what he's asked of you. It's this conundrum of the closer you get, the more he reveals what needs to change. And so then you get closer, and then more is revealed. And it's not that you're more and more and more. It's that the sin that is dwelling within you is being revealed. And so don't, don't beat yourself up. Here's, here's where he goes on to say in verse 20, whoa, is this a, did I repeat this? Verse 20 says, now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Man, Paul repeated himself within four verses, right? Why would he do that? Because he needs to believe it? Because you need to believe it? Because if you call yourself a sinner the rest of your life after you come to know Jesus Christ, you'll be someone who sins. But if you realize that you've found victory in Jesus Christ and that is just the sin that dwells within you, Man, whatever you call yourself is what you'll do. And so the sin dwells within you. But it is not I. It is the sin that dwells within me. So you have to separate and not call yourself that if you know God. We'll talk more about that. 21. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Man, if you follow Jesus, you know what this means. Like, I remember the first baptism I ever got to be a part of. Uh, she came back the next Sunday. She's like, yo, Seth, you didn't tell me life was going to get harder. I said, well, you're in the game now. You're off the bench. Things are going to get harder. The enemy doesn't come at those who are just chilling in a pew. The enemy comes at those who are faithfully following Jesus Christ and making steps of who he is. Verse 22, here we go. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive of the law of sin that dwells in my members. Man, that's confusing. What do you mean? Well, we'll get there. It's further on. But verse 24 says this, wretch man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's a cry out. Let me read that the way Paul would read it. At least they put an exclamation point in it. Wretch man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Could you hear it? Like, 
man, Paul's really struggling. Another word says, who will rescue me? Another translation that's NIV, I believe. Who will rescue me? And when you take a minute to recognize that it didn't work out and that you are, in fact, a failure, the question you can ask yourself is, who will rescue me? Not, why did I do this? Why do I keep on doing this? Those questions don't solve it. The question that solves it is, who will rescue me? Who will deliver me from this body of death? Man, pain is, Paul is really feeling a lot of pain, and he's sharing it all with us. He's trying to, like, work it all out with us. Half the world knows that pain, though. Half the, the world knows half of what Paul is going through, right? The, the idea of, you know, forget anything else. I fell me. I fell my own standards. Forget my friend's standards. Forget even God's standards. I can't even do the things that I want to do. I start them, and then I give up and give in and don't do them. We fell ourselves. We fell our families. We fell the test. We fell the task. We fell relationships. That's half the pain, and everybody knows that. But Christians, we know the full pain of what Paul is talking about. Because what a wretch man I am means that we recognize our failure isn't just our own standards. It's we felt God's standards. Which means we've missed some portion of the life that God has for us. We miss the good and we miss where God would send us so that others could see it. Some of us in here today, maybe you've not understood who could rescue you, which made you not understand the weight of the law doesn't save you. It's God's holiness, God's sovereignty, and God's majesty which saves you. That because you go back to the rules and the law as what is determining of whether or not you're getting it right, you end up living in habits that you shouldn't because you're so focused on one portion of the list that you miss the other portions. What I mean is maybe you're living in a lust indulgence and you don't even realize how it's separating you from the holiness of God. And you know, even if you're not to the point of understanding God yet, maybe you would realize this. It is not good for you anyways. It's not doing you any favors to, to foster that habit. Here's what I mean. If you have a lust habit and you're married, your marriage is deteriorating whether you think it or not. If you're not married, but you hope to be, and you have a lust habit, you're creating the most unreasonable expectations ever for the person you hope to marry. If you're not married and you don't ever want to be married, you are looking at someone who's made in the image of God as someone who's meant to give you pleasure the way you want it. None of those things are good and remove you from what God would have to do with your life if it's a habit and you stay there. Maybe you say, Seth, that's not me. I don't do that. Okay, I'm not saying everybody has that. I think a lot of people have some struggle with sexual sin they'll never address. But maybe that's not you and maybe you're just a gossiper. Maybe you show up on Sundays and you sing with the same tongue that curses your brother uh, maybe you show up and you're like, man, that person's breath was bad Sunday. They were sitting behind me and I could smell it in front of me. I don't even know how it curved like that. M- man, I don't like the way she sang. She is not good. I know some of y'all have said that actually, and it's actually hurt the human you were talking about because they talked to me about it. Maybe you don't like the pastor that day. Maybe you don't like that music, so you go and you talk about it. You call people like, hey, you won't believe what happened. I know, what, I know what goes on and what's really going on in Madison County. All right, so we do these things. So maybe you gossip because your life is so full of failure and disappointment, you're trying to distract yourself. Maybe you don't gossip. Maybe you're past gossiping. You think, I'm not even going to talk to people because they don't even matter. I'll just have a critical spirit about everything. And everything's not good. Everything's bad. I'm just going to complain through everything. Whew. I've been there. When I was in the military, I feel like that was the easiest thing to do to, to cope with what was going on. But the problem is, you know, well, the the next thing maybe is idolatry. And I even think that a critical spirit is a form of idolatry. You've become your own God where you think that what you say and matters is the most important thing and you have the right to complain about everything. But maybe it's not the complaining, it's another form of idolatry. And idolatry is simply anything that you make more important than God. You, it could be yourself, your ego, your job, your wealth, your family, your spouse, politics, your preference of church music on Sundays. What's your idol? Your kids? Most of us have done some of the things I'm talking about. I could go and make a list, but that would defeat the purpose of where we're going. But most of us have had some of these struggles. And here's the crazy part. All of us have also lied about not having those struggles. And we know that lying about our failures and disappointment doesn't bring us closer to the holiness of God. So what should we do instead? Instead, you should ask the question, Not why do I do it, 
is this wrong? Who will rescue me? Who will deliver me? Matter of fact, I'd love, just real quick, maybe you, you, don't, you don't think you need to say that yet. You don't admit it yet. I'll just give you some freedom. Let's all say who will rescue me together. Ready? Who will rescue me? One more time because you need to know this. Ready? Who will rescue me? But maybe instead of that actually being the question you're asking, maybe you're thinking, yeah, I failed. No big deal. I'll get myself out of this. I'll get myself out of this. Well, based off of all the scripture we just read, there is no self-help from failure and sin. Paul is basically saying all of those people who seek to save themselves are pretty much dead. If we fail our own selves and our standards, what makes us think that we're the solution to live up to God's standards? That's kind of crazy, right? We would check someone in for something of that logical fallacy. We don't. Why do we do this then? Here's what I know. I have failed way too many times for me to continue to put my hope in myself. I am so thankful that God uh, allowed me to fail as little as he did, even though it was tons, so that I could stop having hope in myself. So I'll tell you, please don't put your hope in me. Don't put your hope in anyone in this room. I'm not trying to say I know you or know what you're worth, but I know that none of you are worth hoping in. But the good news is that there is something to hope in. And some of us have been so uncomfortable with like a, whoa, I keep doing this thing that I don't know what to do. Is there hope? And you read ahead to verse 25 because there is hope of who will deliver you. Let's go to verse 25. Y'all ready for this? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Man, that's another exclamation point. I didn't yell, he yelled. I just did it for you. Because you should be excited. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Wait, you can do both of those? That's confusing. But here's the good news. He's done focusing on all that we have struggled with, and he's pointing to all the hope of what actually changes it. Jesus Christ. And then he says right here in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? All those failures I listed, the lust, the idolatry, the gossip, anything you can think of that is outside of God's good will for your life, there's no condemnation for those things anymore. Man, I hope you would really remember that because if you don't remember this, you will get stuck in the cycle of failure and disappointment a lot longer than you should and everyone else is paying for you to be in there. But it was already paid for, so stop making other people pay for it. Here's where, here's where he continues on. He says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. Remember what I said about rules and going back to it? For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. Man, how come so many of our relationships are based off of rules and standards and expectations when we know that even the laws God gave were weakened by the flesh and did not save us. But instead, how did what we could not do, how did it get done? Well, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteousness requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. What Paul is saying, what you can't do, Stop focusing on it. God already did it. God did what you could not do. God did what the law could not do. And then Paul, being the wise, changed, redeemed person that he is, says, hey, listen, any time that you focus on God has already done it and it's been forgiven and bought and paid for, you need to be warned because you're going to fall into the trap of saying, oh, it's so cool. I can do it. It's been paid for. So Paul, in verse 5, gives us a warning. Here's what he says. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live in according to the spirit set their minds on things of the spirit. For the set mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on spirit is life and peace. Hey, listen, the rest of your life you'll probably struggle and you'll even be tricked by allowing people into your close circle who are actually living by the flesh. It is very hard to know those things without super close relationship. But I will tell you, it is a lot easier, in my opinion, to know if someone is living in the spirit than if they're living by the flesh. Because if they're living in the spirit, the fruit of the peace will, or the spiritual fruit will absolutely be present in their life. And I'm not saying you need to get rid of everybody who's not perfect, but I'm saying the people you are closest to, 
should be bearing fruit so that you can grow. It continues on. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's heavy. But Paul is saying pay attention to your fleshly desires because the problem is they will lead you down a path of greater failure, failure, continued disappointment, furthered rebellion. Paul's trying to warn you. And, and I think he's so understanding of what he's talking about that he doesn't even stay there very long with the warning. Because here's what he goes on to say. He says, no, no, it's not going to happen to you, but not you. You aren't going to do this. He's talking to us. If you're a believer in this room, he's talking to you. He's saying, not you. You're not going to do that. You're going to live by the Spirit. In verse 9, he says it like this. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. In fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Do you ever remember that when you fail? Do you ever remember that when you have some disappointment? I sure hope other people remember this when I fail and I disappoint them. And here's what I mean. I think Paul is saying this. If the spirit of Christ is in you, you will live no matter. Yeah, well, of course you, your flesh failed me. You failed your own standards. You think you're ever going to not fail mine? But then I think, but in Christ you're victorious. I think God says, God's response to our failure is, to all our failure, last, last year, our whole lifetime, two weeks ago, yesterday, last night, before you came in this, car, this building and you were in the car, I know some of y'all failed, that's okay. But he's saying, in your flesh you failed yourself and you let me, your holy God, down. But in Christ, you are victorious. Failure and disappointment are just meant to be bumps in a phase. But don't you dare. Please, 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 please do not miss the opportunity in that moment of failure and disappointment to miss out on the chance to learn about the sufficiency of God. In those moments, you have an opportunity to really realize just how sufficient God is. That's what all of that is saying. If it's on you, you're gonna run around in circles like Paul did in that text, having no idea why he did what he did. But then he said, wait a minute. Jesus is still good. It's just a phase. I don't have to run from it. I'm not gonna miss an opportunity to remember the sufficiency of God. As I think Paul tells us now, based off what we did and how God responded, how we should respond, he's gonna tell us. By the way, you should always respond to what God did and what he's done and what he's doing. It should cause us to respond. We love because he first loved us, right? And in short, and I think this is the big idea, I think the big idea is failures and disappointment do not remove you 
from God's plan for your life. With the Holy Spirit, they become an opportunity. They become opportunities to learn about and engage with God more than ever before. More with God than ever before. Failures and disappointments aren't meant to keep you from God's plan for your life. With the Holy Spirit, they are meant to be opportunities to make you more engaged with what God has done than ever before. That's all you should ever see when you look back and you remember your failures. That will mean you have to look back and remember them. I think for a long time the American church has said, no, 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 we don't talk about people's pasts. That's stupid. We wouldn't read the Bible if we didn't talk about people's pasts. You would hurt everyone in your life if you didn't know the dumb things that were done. We got to remember our failures and disappointments because the sufficiency of God is huge in those moments. So will you Romans 12 to it and test it out? Or will you just miss it? Don't let the fact that you failed last week, yesterday, 47 minutes ago, two hours from now, remove you from what God wants to do in your life. I think Paul even shows us the contrary. I think he shows up and says, no, 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 this is an opportunity to glorify God like never before. I almost didn't come back here because I was so worried that my past failures would prevent people from knowing Jesus because of who I used to be. But no, 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 that's not true. All of my failures only make God look better, only make him look more powerful and mighty because he could use a wretch like me because he rescued me and delivered this body from death. Amen? Some of y'all need to know that when you're talking to yourselves in your heads that Jesus Christ has delivered you from death. You can own up to your failures without having to be beat down because you failed. And Paul is going to tell us this right here, Romans eight twelve. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship or daughtership. And, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Man. Man. Some of y'all need to know that. Some of y'all would not live in the derailment of failure and disappointments for as long as if you could just stand confidently knowing that I am God's daughter. I am God's son. Hey, enemy, do you know who my father is? I may have failed, but do you know my dad? Do you know my Abba father? So we're going to talk about uh, how the spiritual warfare could be could be in play here. And I want to talk more. I'm, I'm trying not to keep you guys too long. I know you uh, are going to go eat disgusting things like pineapple on pizza. So we're going to try to change your hearts real quick. We believe in spiritual warfare at Calvary Church. And we could teach an entire series on just how blind we are often to what's going on. But I think we're going to try, he's going to try to get us to not learn from our failures and disappointment. And Satan's going to try to have two victories in your life when this happens. A little one and a big one. The little victory is when you fall you fall and you give in to the sin that dwells within you. That's the little victory. You fell, God's holy person rebelled against him and chose to allow sin rather than him. That's a little victory. But that's not the big victory. The big victory is what, come next, is what comes after that or can come after that. It does not have to. But here's what often comes. And you know this is true. So just think about when this was in your life. Is when you allowed failure to create disappointment and create shame. And it just becomes a cycle. Failure, disappointment, shame, which leads to more failures. And if you don't think shame leads to more failures after a first failure, go read Genesis 4 and see what happened to Cain. He made one mistake, and instead of owning up, he covered it up with another terrible mistake that cost someone else their life. That's what we do. We say, I guess God could never love me. I blew it again. There's no hope for me. I wasn't the parent my kids needed. They'd be better off without me as a dad. I was unfaithful in my marriage. I shouldn't even try. I should just keep being unfaithful. I failed at my job. Who cares if I ever excel at work again and leave my kids an inheritance? Who cares? There's no way God would hope. There's no way God would ever give me a second, third, fourth, or fifth chance. And hey, I want you to know most people, even most people who claim to be followers of Jesus, They don't act like this to other people. Most of the world doesn't think God gives second, third, fourth, and fifth chances because we don't give them. 
we don't give second, third, fourth, and fifth chances to people. God does. Thank you, God. So we should as well. But here's the crazy part. That, those things, God's not worried about those things. You know why? He had a plan for that. He had a strategy for that. <laughs> He's not worried about those things. He, the everyday sin, he died for it. He's got the strategy for that. So that conundrum of why am I doing this? No, 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 no. You're getting tricked into out of, you're getting tricked out of God's purpose for your life. Because you forgot what's already been done, what's already been paid for. That's the big, that's the big victory. And, and, and here's what I mean. I think, I think sometimes, some of us in this room, we're just giving Satan victories after victory after victory. Because here's the thing. I wanted to grow up, and I never wanted to be my dad. I said, I'm not going to be my dad. I'm going to be a good dad. I'm going to be a good husband. And so the moment I would make a mistake that fell into me becoming my dad, I would lie and hide it and not get help for it. And then I would end up becoming my father. Which passed on that same hurt to other people. We saw that in the book of Genesis with all that trauma passing on, right? And so here's what I mean. I was talking with a parent a few messages ago after service, and they came up to me, and they said, I just don't, my, my kids are strange. Some really crazy stuff happened in their kiddo's life uh, involving some stuff. And, and I'm not trying to minimize the situation because this, this mom loves God and loves her kid. Um, but we got to the point where she's like, he just he doesn't want anything to do with us. And, I, you know, I tried telling him, you know, we just did the best we could. We just did the best we knew how. That's when I realized what the problem was. Based off of all the scripture we just read, I really want you to stop saying, I just did the best I could. I just did the best I knew how. It's an excuse that I think tries to make it not all your fault, and it's not all your fault. But what I mean by this is, What? Your best? That's a really low bar. And if you, if you don't understand all the scripture we just read, I will give you another illustration. Pretend God is up here and you're in a line and behind him is heaven on earth. And you're going to come up and you're going to ask him, or he's going to ask you, should you be allowed in heaven on earth? What are you going to say? You're going to say, yes, I did the best I could. I did the best I knew how. No, you won't say that. You wouldn't say that. And hey, if you would say that, please come talk with me. Because if anything about what we just read is true, the best you can do, the best you know how to do right now, sends you to hell. The best you can do sends you to hell. So why would we ever be surprised when our relationships with our kids are suffering because we settled for, that was the best I could do. That was the best I knew. Why are we surprised when people don't believe in God when we've just done the best we could? We've just done the best we know. If it sends you to hell, what does it do to others? I think you fall into these cycles of failure, disappointment, shame, more failure, more disappointment, more shame, because you stop learning. I know this is crazy. Seth, I'm, I'm done with school. What are you talking about? You're never done learning. Not if you follow Jesus. Matter of fact, the first ever life group of 12 students, 12 disciples, followed a teacher, a rabbi, and they became the primary vehicle to deliver his Holy Spirit and the good news to the world. Jesus used learners. And let me tell you, this is why, like, I think this is a big reason why so many people are are four young people, because they're willing to learn. You know what happens the moment you find someone who thinks they know everything, not willing to learn, you probably don't like talking to them. Well, the same is true with, you can't hear from God if you're not willing to learn. And you have to continue to learn. And here's what I mean. When you're around people who love God and are learning more, do you know you'll be a part of a group and you'll fail and not get kicked out of it? Man, did the disciples ever fail. But Jesus didn't kick them out. If anything, he would lean in and teach them how, the God, how God in heaven would respond, how their heavenly father would respond, what he would do. He came and took on flesh and taught what he would do. Now, here's the crazy part. One of the disciples chose his fear and disappointment and didn't think the hope of Jesus could save him. And that disciple removed his own flesh from this world because he stopped trying to learn who Jesus was and he was trying to learn what he could get out of him, which made him miss everything. So stop trying to run from your current failures. 
Step into the victory of Jesus Christ and what he's done and what he can do, remembering all of those things so that others can find freedom, so that you can, but more importantly, so that others can find freedom. I've got some really simple practical application as the band makes their way back up. I wish I could, uh, you know, like, I wish if you guys have got a phone, hey, record this for me, right? This is so unique and original, this practical application. It's not. It's really the simplest stuff in the world. But it's, I wish I could have made it up because it's so easy. So what do you do? Instead of running from failures, how do you find freedom from that? Well, this is going to be huge, okay? Listen. First step, confess. Man, isn't that simple? Failures can be treated the same way as a sin. You just got to admit that you failed. If we confess sin to God, and we're supposed to confess sin to others as well, then why would we not confess our failures to God, admit them, and admit them to others. Matter of fact, one of the best ways to help someone know the goodness of God is to humble yourself enough to admit when you failed so they can see how God has always come through. This, of course, does mean you'll have to live out last week's message and remember. We've got to remember those failures. And the second one, another super groundbreaking principle, repent. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Confess and repent. And repent in Greek, the word for that, actually means to change your thoughts. It doesn't mean turn from sin or turn towards God. However, if you repent the way it says to in the Bible, you change your thoughts upon him. If you're facing him, you can't face sin. Now, I can turn from this sin and still face sin. So you got to change your thoughts, which means learn. You got to learn. You got to learn. You got to draw closer to who God is, who his who he is, so that in the moment of the failure and disappointment, you won't forget the truths about God's character that the enemy is going to try to discourage you from remembering. Learn. And here's what I mean. God is trying to grow us and teach us things. And he allows other people to suffer through our failures and disappointment. Some of you think taking the name of God in vain is GD this or JC that but a much more biblically accurate definition for taking God's name in vain would be something like my wife being hurt because of what I've done and me never changing. Even though the grace of God has existed, I would have taken up the mantle of following Christ of God for no reason at all. So how many of you don't learn from your failures and the other people are suffering for no reason? Those people shouldn't have to suffer for long because all the suffering that was ever needed has already happened. So just learn. The longer you refuse to learn and do things differently for the goodness of God, the more people are getting hurt. So what can we do? Well, you can learn. You can draw closer to him through scripture, through prayer. One of the best ways is to have conversations with people. I think it's the best way so much so that Jesus Christ took on flesh, became a person and walked around with people and talked with them, telling them how they were missing the mark and meeting their needs. I think they were probably playing paper, rock, scissors too, having a good time together enjoying life. Jesus was probably always winning. Would you stand with me this morning? I know we're here a little longer than usual, so make sure you thank the people who are are watching over our children and, and teaching them the principles of God. But we can't rush or we'll miss something. We'll miss the failure. We won't remember it.